you. Um, good morning, everybody. I'm, I'm happy to be in Chicago. I have a wireless mic. I'm just wondering, would anybody be offended if I played Donkey Kong the entire time I did this presentation? Because it's, it's calling me. This is really hard to talk about games and not play that game. Um, right, so, so I'm going to talk about um, games and mobile learning today, but I want to do something that's going to kind of thwart a, a good bit of the, the, the ideas that uh, Scott just put out there. So um, how many people here are tweeting? OK, I'm going to ask you not to tweet. I'm going to ask you to do something different. My lovely assistant, Aaron Silvers here, is handing out post-it notes. So I had this radical idea, particularly somewhat inspired by tapestry, but somewhat inspired by the fact that as a game maker, I like to do a lot of analog games. We do card games and board games. And so what I really want you to do is instead of tweeting something, write it down. Put your name on it, or not, it's up to you. And then just start passing it around the room. And as these things are being passed around the room, if you like it, just put, draw a little star on it. Now at the end of this, what I want to do is collect all these, and I want to post them on a blog. So there'll be like this weird analog social note-taking thing with ratings. So if you're going to write, you better write something good, particularly if you're crediting yourself. Um, so I, I just, it's just a, an interesting experiment I thought I'd try. I, I, I really like the social aspect, as you'll see during this talk. I really like the social aspect of gaming. Um, I, I, and it parallels a lot with the content that I like in learning. When I started learning way back uh, when I was working for an airline, um, we did this really cool training stuff. And this was back in 90, 1996, so this was a, a while ago. Um, we were using this great program called AuthorWare. And we had this other great program called Rapid. And AuthorWare for, see, I see people chuckling. So I know that, every, I know that somebody here knows what I'm talking about. When, when we used AuthorWare, we hated it. But in truth, AuthorWare was easily the best learning platform to date that's been devised for e-learning content. Because it let you do really simple things or really complex things. And we actually combined that with another tool that allowed us to embed simulations. And it was really exciting at the time because we did this really crazy, technically cool stuff. And as the e-learning world has evolved, what's really kind of bothered me a little bit is that we've gone from this really technical stuff to this really simplistic stuff. But all the while, we're always staring at screens. It's one of the things I like about what Float's doing with Tapestry is that it's more of a social experiment, right? I mean, we're, we're now sharing our content versus just staring at screens. And gaming's done the same thing. If you think about how games used to be. I mean, board games, you know, games you'd sit with your family at the table, you know, Candyland, you know, whatever, and you'd play these games, Scrabble, what have you. But it was a social event. And then computer games came along and we all started staring at a screen. I mean, I can sit here and play Donkey Kong while I talk, but it's going to be really boring for everybody because I'm just going to be staring at the screen. So it became a, a bit of a solitary adventure. And it still kind of maintains that, even with some of the, uh, the, the broader uh, multiplayer games like World of Warcraft and what have you. Um, so my interest in mobile learning is really to bring it back into the social world, which is also why I'm interested in having people write things down and, and exchange them, because it really does get people to share their ideas in a little bit of a broader space, less anonymously. Um, I do tweet, but I'm actually not a physical construct of my Twitter personality. My Twitter personality is part of me. But in the tweet world, you become a physical construct of your personal, of your Twitter personality. So I think the social aspect of that and getting to know people is very important. So with that said, um, I do want to talk, I'm going to talk, a lot about mobile, mobile games. And when I started thinking about what I wanted to talk about in experience design and experiences, uh, I thought about the last time I was in Chicago. And the last time I was in Chicago was uh, probably about a month ago, three weeks ago, a month ago. And I was here, it was the first time to the day that I'd been to Chicago in 20 years, which was just a really weird thing. Um, but uh, I, I visited my friend, Aaron, and Aaron took me to this bar that's located around here called the Violet Hour. Now, the Violet Hour, if you're not familiar with it, is a really interesting bar. It's a really interesting place. And what I learned was that when you're walking down the street and you see something and you see a wall, with a door and a light and uh, some art or some graffiti on it, it just looks like nothing. However, when you go inside, 
you see that it's something totally different. It's a beautiful, amazing, expansive place. And the analogy for me with mobile learning is just that. We've got these little devices that we carry around with us that are really simple. But we've got tools within these devices, and I mean all of them, not just smartphones, that we can really create a user experience, an experience for the player, both in learning and in just play, that goes way beyond this little screen. And in fact, I think we should not be confined to this little screen. Um, and I think it's a very important aspect that a lot of people forget about. And a lot of people don't even consider when we're talking about mobile games. And when you think about mobile games, first game that comes to mind, Angry Birds, right? How many people play Angry Birds? Okay, you shoot a bird from a slingshot at pigs. That doesn't seem, I mean, it doesn't seem like it's too difficult on the front, and it's not. But there's more to the game that really draws you in. Um, and, and we're going to talk about that a little bit. So let me, let me talk about um, me. I like to talk about me a little bit. Um, just to give you an idea of my background. Um, as Scott mentioned, I, I did work in the airline industry. Um, I managed the team at US Airways that built all the ground school flight training instruction for 737 pilots. And at the end of this talk, I want to put this thought in your head. Next time you're getting on a 737, I wrote that training. <laughs> Enjoy your flight. <laughs> um, so, so, so I started there, and I, I started my own company. and. Um, we have been using game technologies and mobile technologies for a long time. Um, and we started, I think about 2000, we started really with the mobile stuff uh, in 2000 and really started pushing it forward in 2005 when we had these neat little Nokia tablets that were pretty interesting. Um, and we've been using gaming technologies along the way the entire time. So we really built that up in 2010. We bought a company called Impact Games, which makes socially responsible gaming. Um, our biggest game is a game called Peacemaker. It's about the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, very light subject matter. Um, and we have another game called Play the News, which is uh, a game that works on uh, mobile phones. It works on desktops. And it's all about building games from news stories. Um, outside of that, we also do a lot of games for corporate training. We've done um, some very interesting card games. I know there are there's at least one customer here in the audience um, who uses the games. And we're very excited about that because I. I like to see that kind of interaction, and I like to see that kind of progress go forward. Um, there's no doubt that, uh, oh, um, I also spoke at Oxford, which in this case is really funny because um, Chad Udell, who's not here, and I feel really bad. He was in a car accident. He had surgery. Yeah, when I spoke at Oxford, I broke my collarbone the day before I had to go, and I still went. So man up, Chad. <laughs> it's breaking the fourth wall right there. <laughs> um, So the first thing about mobile games is that they're really addictive. Um, this is in my office. This is not an uncommon site. I actually had a better picture of this, which I can't find. And it's something that we see a lot. And, and there's books that are starting to surface about these little devices and what we do with them and how it somewhat isolates us from them. But this is typically what happens. Um, well, not typically in the office, because we actually try to do work occasionally. Um, but at lunch, I had a great picture at lunch. I had five developers lined up. We're sitting at a diner. We're all sitting at the bar, and everybody's doing this. And they're all playing various games. And why are they playing games? Because they're so engaging, because they really take part of our time. Some interesting statistics from a, uh, a website called newzoo.com. Um, this year, the number of mobile gamers is jumping 35%, totaling 100 million gamers. Um, that does count in the United States 21 million tablets, which I don't consider a mobile device. Um, it's the only thing that I think Mark Zuckerberg and I have agreed on. Um, he said that in a talk. It was great, and everybody got all upset about it. But I, it taught an iPad, an iPad is not a mobile device to me. Um, but 100 million users, that's a pretty big number. Um, there's some very interesting other pieces here. Um, Every day in the US, 4.2 million iOS games are downloaded. Every day. Um, I probably make up for about the 0.2 of that myself. 53% um, of mobile users play a game once a day. So we can see that this is a pretty big market. I mean, this is a pretty big piece, and it's pretty engaging. And it's engaging because these devices 
are very, they're, they're always with people. They're very personal to people. And when you're sitting somewhere and you don't have anything to do for a couple minutes, you're going to pull it out and you're going to play a game. I mean, the, the gaming industry to me has always been fascinating. When I was working at the airline, um, I insisted to my manager that me and uh, one of my developers always got to go to gaming conferences like E3 and, and all these other things um, for two reasons. One, because it's a gaming conference and really, <laughs> why would I not want to do that? I got to fly for free, so hey, if I could take the day off and get a positive space seat, I'm going. Um, two, if you look at the history of computers, the first companies to jump on the new power of computers is always the gaming companies, always has been. You, know, you see uh, an up in the processor, then Unreal ups their engine. You know, and, and it's always the gaming companies that are pushing those envelopes. It's always the gaming companies that have driven, at least in my life, a lot of the need to purchase a new computer because I wanted to play you know, Diablo or Flight Simulator. I always played Flight Simulator. It's why I liked working in the, uh, in the aviation industry because really, to me, in the learning world, there's a very thin line between simulations and games. And um, I was lucky enough to get to fly the full motion simulation, which to me was a big game. Um, and I may have broken the simulator at least once, but that's another story. Um, so, th so the mobile game statistics are, are pretty astonishing. And when we combine those with the actual mobile statistics, which we will talk about in a few minutes, um, you'll see that the reach is huge. The first thing people think about when we talk about games are games like Angry Birds. And Angry Birds is I mean, phenomenal success by any measure. Over a billion players at 99 cents. Uh, we're talking about uh, a franchise that has spawned God knows how many clones of these games. I mean, and it's not the first physics-based game. I mean, let's not kid ourselves here. There are tons of them. You know, when I was little, you know, I mean, there was the pinball construction set. That's a physics game at the end of it. You know, you've got a game on the slope and the ball bunches around and you've got to make your own system. So this is not the first physics game to be built, but it was very successful. Um, it's very successful because, one, it's got engaging content. Two, it's got updating content. Three, it's so simple to play, right? As I said, it's a slingshot with a bird at pigs. You do it. You do it again. You do it. You do it again. There's not a whole lot to do here, um, but beyond that, Rovio really built something that made sense on these little screens. We talk about mobile gaming. We talk about these little screens, and I think that that's very important to recognize first and foremost because we don't have a lot of real estate to work with. When we start thinking about game development and current games and computer games. I think there's a bit of a tendency to say, well, we're just going to translate this over to a mobile device, much like we do in the e-learning world, right? I mean, I've seen more people get up and go on this rant about how the thing they need to do is put all their courseware on a mobile device, the most asinine thing I've ever heard. I, 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 had, I was at a conference once, an aviation conference, and a flight manager stood up and this is just three years ago. We were talking about the iPhone. He said, why can't I get my hydraulic system lesson on my iPhone? And I said, why would you want it on your iPhone? You can't see it. I mean, I got pretty good vision, and that would drive me nuts after about, I don't know, 30 seconds. So imagine how that would be on an iPhone. I mean, it's World of Warcraft. It's 12 million users, huge game, and this is a typical interface, you know? I mean, you users mod their interfaces. How would you fit that on this? You really have to sit and think about what you're doing to convert this content to a little screen. So when you're trying to design your game and when you're thinking about game design itself, you know, the first hurdle is, how am I gonna put it on this little screen? What, what kind of user experience am I gonna get? And that's why games like Angry Birds, Doodle Jump, and all the other type of games work so well because it's a really simple mechanic, the one-touch game. I once saw a contest that was great. It was a, it was a GDC, in, a game developers conference, and it wasn't even for mobile devices, but it was a game where you had to write a game using Flash, but you could only use one button. And it sounds a little odd, but think about that as it pertains to this little screen, because you have one button, right? So these are things that certainly, uh, are, are quite important as we go to uh, 
the mobile transition and we think about these easy games, but even easy games, even simple games, are not as simple as they seem on the surface. And that's actually what makes them successful. So I, I was in the, um, what do we call it here, the L? Is that what we call it, Aaron? Is that what we're on? Yes, okay. Mm -hmm. And um, that, okay, that's a little hard to read. I, 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 I tried to enhance it as best I could. Um, there's this great ad, and it was about darts. Now darts is a phenomenal game. I'm horrifically bad at darts. I have been kicked off of dartboards in pubs because I'm so bad at darts. Um, but this ad was fantastic because this ad talks about the dart and it says, the dart, it's a really simple thing. Or is it? And it talks about the physics of the dart and the different pieces of the dart that ensure that the back of the dart will never get ahead of the front of the dart just by the use of drag. That's why they got the little feathers on the dart. How many people play darts and think about that when they're throwing their dart? No, because it's a simple concept. But it's not a simple concept. It's actually easier. And as the, as the game says, just knowing this can help you win that $3 bet so you can get your next beer for free. So let's apply this same kind of principle to mobile gaming. We'll go back to Angry Birds. Angry Birds in and of itself is, of course, a simple mechanic, but that's not what makes it engaging. What makes it engaging are the stories and the content. I mean, like it or, believe it or not, people really love these little pigs and these little birds. I mean, it's movies, toys, games. I mean, this, these guys are sitting on a mountain of revenue from this game, and it's all around the story. It's not so much around the game, it's around the story. So you think about that when you're trying to apply. I mean, and this, this doesn't just apply to gaming. This applies to learning, right? I mean, you think about anything. You need to have a convincing story. You need to have a reason for people to sit there and engage in what you're trying to show them. And that's certainly true with gameplay. So the story becomes really critically important. But mobile gaming takes many forms. And I think there's a lot of, uh, there's a whole lot on this subject aside from just something as simple as Angry Birds, right? And, and I'm not going to talk about, well, I am going to talk about gamification, but I'm not, I don't like the term gamification because I think it's really a stupid idea. Is anybody here, how many people here know what gamification is? Okay, so, so for those of you who don't, gamification is the concept of using game mechanics, scores, badges, leaderboards, rankings, et cetera, and layering that on top of your content in an effort to make your content more engaging it is not going to make your content more engaging. Your content needs to be engaging to begin with. So if you're going to try and put these things on top of your content, you're going to have boring content with gamification that your users are going to hate. I, I can show you the studies that prove that. I saw a great statistic the other day that said gamification, there was 5% of people completed courses with gamification versus 50 without it because people don't want to sit through that. So, so that. so I just want to clarify that because what I'm about to show you is an idea of gamification done well. And I'll, I'll show you why it's done well. People know what this is? Anybody familiar with this? The Nike Fuel Band? It's great. I have one right here. I bought it as soon as it came out. I thought it was a brilliant concept because it's, it, it talks to my little mobile device. Um, it somewhat accurately. Um, tells me how much exercise I've done, what I've done for the day, what kind of activity I've had. And it's a ranking system. And it's a really neat system because this, and I was actually really glad to see um, Jim talk about the Arduino board because I love sensors. Sensors are my new, it's something I've been working on for a while. And integrating sensors with these little devices because that just expands the user experience and the way that people connect with this. And that's exactly what this little band does, this little thing. And on the band, when you get your goal, it says goal. But what Nike did was take this and build a game on top of it. And it's kind of a game, I mean, you can compete with others, but really it's a game you set challenges for yourself. And they have this neat little portal. So in the portal, and this is a conglomeration of images that make up the entire portal. So the portal, we've got the screen that tells me how I'm doing on the day. It shows my little graph. It shows what days I've made it, what days I haven't. At the bottom, it shows me how I've compared. And then over here, in the lower right-hand corner, we've got this little guy. is the Nike Fuel guy. And he pops up every time I do something cool. 
I will work doing whatever I have to do just to see this guy because he's that cool. Because these guys, Nike has done a really good job of this. They figured out how to make this little game engaging with your mobile device. And really, that's what it works with. It communicates with your iPhone. Um, they figured out a way how to do this. And they figured out how to do it by looking at the device and understanding what components are in that device and designing a game, designing a platform to those components. So when we take a look at the typical smartphone, we see that the smartphone is actually built with a lot of different components. And this is where I think this gets very interesting. So um, smartphones, just by way of, uh, of discussion here, um, and I, I have a very distinct way of talking about mobile users because I, uh, typically at conferences people talk very United States centric about mobile users and I understand why that happens but I think we need to consider the broader scope of things. I mean we're, we're it's nice to think that the US is doing this but you know we're kind of in a global market and if we're going to compete and you're going to compete then you need to think about that because your learners or your game players aren't always going to be in the US. So worldwide, there are currently uh, about uh, 1 billion devices that will be activated this year, smartphones. Smartphones, not total phones, just smartphones. Um, according to Ericsson, uh, the company that used to make smartphones, but then got bought by Sony and now is no longer Sony, um, smartphones will reach 3 billion users by 2017. That's a pretty big base. And what interests me about mobile games, and it's starting to change. I mean, it's starting to change. But what interests me about mobile games is that so many of them focus on looking down at the screen and doing something. But let's consider, and you know, given the conference, I think we need to extend this not just to games, but let's consider learning in general. Let's consider this device and what it does. It's got notifications when something happens. It can contain video audio. It's got location-based content. It knows where you are anytime you are. And if you don't think it does, um, there's a couple files that you can see that really give an interesting picture of where you've been. Um, you may recall Apple not too long ago kind of got busted because they had that log file. I downloaded my log file. It was fascinating. It was like a where's Waldo kind of look of where I've been in the past year. Um, has touch capabilities. It does Short message service, SMS, has a camera. It has data that's always on, unless you turn it off. But for the most part, we really don't, unless we're sitting in an airplane, in which case we have to. Otherwise, much like Alec Baldwin, we get thrown off. Um, and it has motion sensors. So we think about all of the things that this device can do. And all of a sudden, if we stop thinking about what we're doing on the screen, we think about games that we can activate in learning or for entertainment that becomes so much broader. So to that end, it's now my turn to show a video. This is a concept. This isn't real.
Okay, so a few things about this video. Number one, I can't be the only person in the room that is thinking that kid is gonna get hit by a car. <laughs> All right. I mean, it, it, but, but it's an interesting aspect. Also of note, uh, no gamer in the free world has ever gotten the pretty girl in the end, except in a game. All right, except maybe Aaron once, I don't know. Um, but that's an interesting aspect, right? So we've got this, this mobile device that this kid is carrying around. He's looking through, he's seeing an altered, altered reality layered on top of what is really out there. He's running around, he's interacting socially with his friends, and he's playing this, this game that's a rather complex game. And to me, that's where I like to see the concept of mobile learning and what's happening. You know, that kind of complex layering that gets you away from here but still uses this little device as your little piece of information is fascinating. There's actually, and I, I don't have a video of this, but I think you can find it uh, on YouTube if you search it. Um, there's a game, a, a company called um, uh, Seven, Seven Scenes uh, that, that's out of uh, the Netherlands. And they had a a game called Frequency 1515, which was a mobile game that was a learning game. And players used these little Nokia feature phones with GPS, and it was for kids to explore medieval Amsterdam. And it was a rudimentary version of what we just saw. And it's a really interesting piece because the kids all learn about medieval Amsterdam, and they're running around Amsterdam, you know, going to different buildings, and they had gameplay involved where they could kind of disrupt the other team's play and, and stop them from advancing. So it, it was a really fascinating piece about what you can do with these mobile games. Now, when we're looking at these games, we want to consider as well the audience that we're building this experience for. So when we think about our typical audience, you know, we think about kids, we think about adults, and we think typically about these types of devices, these smartphone devices. And the reason that I think that the previous video is so important is because you don't, as well as Frequency 1515, this other example, you don't need a smartphone to do this kind of gaming, this kind of gameplay. You can build these games just using these as a reference device. And I think that's important because while we tend to think of our audience having smartphones, there's an entire, uh, there's an entire other audience in the world that we may think about that doesn't have smartphones. And this isn't just the case in somewhere like Africa. Um, it's not always about the technology that we have here on these little phones. So a couple statistics that I think are very interesting when we think about these as platforms. Um, there are currently 4.8 billion unique phone users in the planet. Um, and that's, that's gonna, this is gonna, these stats are gonna seem a little weird, but bear with me. There are, of all of the mobile phones, and those are unique phone users, okay? So those are unique devices. But in many instances, these single devices have multiple accounts, okay? So 4.8 billion unique users, five billion SMS users in the planet. So there are actually more people that use SMS than exist current phones, because again, the shared accounts. So that actually beats out voice on the phones by about 100 million people. So more people use SMS than use voice. So think about that as a mechanic when you're trying to design something like a mobile game. And it's actually really possible to do that. I'm gonna show you a, a quick example of that. Um, cameras in phones will pass 4.5 billion devices this year. So now we've got another, another aspect, um, something simple, right, a camera. Um, of these handsets, the majority of them are not smartphones, they're actually feature phones and dumb phones. Something else to consider. Um, but even then, most of those dumb phones do have color screens, they can render HTML, they have Java, and they all have SMS capabilities. And I'm talking about that because I think that's a really huge point. If you think about how you might implement a game within your organization, and just as an example, um, we did a game at a mobile learning conference two years ago. And when we started looking at it, it was an alternate reality game. So it was a game that used a lot of elements, including the phone. It was called, um, I can't remember what the name was called. <laughs> well, that's embarrassing. Uh, it was at MLearnCon uh, of 2009. 
No, that was the card game. Um, hmm? Return. Thank you. Yes, that's what it was. I can't even remember my own games. That's uh, wow. Um, we were looking at smartphones and trying to figure out how to use it. We eventually settled on SMS. And we built an entire system that anybody with a phone with SMS could use to interact with the game. And that meant that we got a whole, a, a much larger user base than we did. I think we had, uh, I think the conference at that time was about 700 people and we had over 50% participation. Um, I can tell you that 50% of the people did not have smartphones but they were still able to play because they had SMS, SMS capabilities. So I think that that's something that's really uh, key and important to understand because the reality is that high tech, I mean, we've got these nice phones, it's not always the answers. You wanna think, you don't wanna be slave to your technology when you're looking at building games for mobile phones. You wanna understand that all of these capabilities exist and it's very possible to build interesting games and interesting experiences without using High tech capabilities. All right. Sure. So, so to this extent, I want to give another example, and this is a, a pretty cool implementation. This is done in Pittsburgh. Um, it's, the, it's not a game per se. Um, it's this thing called Public Record, and Public Record was developed by a company in Pittsburgh called Deep Local, um, and it was with an artist in Pittsburgh, and they basically built a geolocation tool so you could use your iPhone with HTML. And as you got close to spots where crimes had occurred in the late 19th century, you would start getting a little beacon and it would recite a poem to you about that crime. What's cool about it is that it also worked with SMS. So if you got to a place, you could, you, you could also carry a map and if you got to a place, you could hit an SMS code and you'd get a call back with an audio version of the poem. So this is a really simple implementation. It doesn't require a whole lot. I mean, at the base of it, you just have to have a phone and a map and SMS. I mean, that's 100% of the, the users of mobile phones on the planet. So as I was saying um, before Top Chef guy interrupted us, um, QR codes are, are, are the same idea. You know, we see all these people having cameras with QR code readers. QR codes are not a new technology. And a lot of people kind of rail on them because they say, well, they're these boring things, but they're really cool. You can put them anywhere. And you can have them go to any URL. So you could think about the gameplay opportunities there and engaging people, particularly when you're trying to learn, you know, maybe a layout of a factory or a layout of an office. You go from point to point, you can start scanning QR codes and make an entire game based upon that. And it's really simple tech to employ. You can make QR codes for free. Um, so just to consider a few factors in what makes mobile gaming successful when you're thinking about planning these games. And, you know, the, the game design theory and how to implement these games is a lot more than I can fit into 45 minutes of talk. Um, but it's, it's, it's a really big subject, but really we can boil it down to, to some very simple pieces. Um, keep it simple. You don't have to make these things complex. You know, uh, make it engaging to the users. You know, storytelling is great. I mean, I, I know, okay, ready? I'm gonna throw up my, uh, my nerd flag here for a minute. You know, when I was younger, I played a lot of Dungeons and Dragons. Yeah, see what I'm talking about? And the great thing about Dungeons and Dragons, and they went away for it, from it, and, and they've, you know, Wizards of the Coast, who now owns the rights of the game, is doing this thing. So, so, so the, the piece that they've done is really cool because they've said they're taking it back to storytelling. And that's the whole point about making it engaging, you know, telling a cool story. You know, so, so I like that as a base just to think about, you know, I mean, because that's what it, that, that game was about, was telling stories. And you've got these devices where people can run around and you can create really compelling stories in learning or in entertainment. It's not one or the other. You know, I mean, we, we need to get away from this idea of thinking that, you know, games are like, if we're using games and learning, we should use Jeopardy and that's really cool. Let's get away from that idea. Let's talk about building an experience that actually gets the users involved in what you're doing because that's when they walk away with that's when they get their takeaways, right? That's when they walk away with the experience, and that's what they remember. The, we did a, uh, uh, an alternate reality game where we built this, this whole uh, experience using Blackberries and mobile phones, and we had Facebook pages, and that was like a fake hotel, and the people loved it, and it was super engaging for them because they got to, they could reply on Facebook, and we had people that would reply to them. So it was like being in the real world environment, and they got points, and they got to play, they loved it. So the engaging part, I'm sorry? 
The name of the game was called Que Sera Sera. It was the Constellation Academy of Wine that we did it for. She interrupted and I forgot the first thought on that. <laughs> um, it, it was an engaging story. I mean, it was just using simple Blackberry and Facebook pages, and, but it, it created an entire engaging environment for, for the users. Um, so using, using the devices, don't use the device as your focus. Use it as a resource. You know, I mean, that's what these things are. They're constantly on resources. You can look up anything. I, I just posted a new thing because I got, I got a little fed up with one of my developers who had to do something. And so he's like trying to talk to all the other developers about this really simple, I don't want to say it was really simple, but this thing. And I finally printed out this thing and I put it on the wall and it just says, Google, the world's leading on-demand learning tool. Right? That's what these things are. They're, they're, as Ray Kurzweil points out, they're the gateway to all human knowledge. It's not a phone. It's a gateway to all human knowledge. So use it as a resource and know your audience. I can't tell you, if you're thinking about a game and you're thinking about doing this, I can't tell you how important it is. Survey your audience, talk to your audience, test with a test audience. Don't just put it out there and hope people are gonna use it because people inevitably will not like something they are not a part of and haven't gotten a test. You know, if you just go out and blindly try to do something, it's not gonna work and that's particularly important with games. I would never make a game for a flight crew. I would definitely make a game for a sales team. And that's just talking to the audience. So you really want to do that. This is the easiest way to find me. And um, please don't hesitate to do so. And I'm happy to take questions, even from next door, um, for the next few minutes. And I'm going to collect all these things. Actually, Aaron's going to collect them. Hey. Chop, chop. All right. Yes? <laughs> really? That's your question? <laughs> um, it's Keynote. So this is Keynote, and then I've got a Keynote remote on my iPhone, and I just go back and forth. That's OK. Anybody else? Was I that good? Or am I just going to see all your questions in the paper, which is really what I'm hoping for? Cool. Yes. Yeah, I was wondering about iPad and how we should not interpret a mobile device here. Okay, I will certainly address that. Um, the, the question was, why is an iPad not a? Why do I feel that an iPad is not a mobile device, or why is it not a mobile device? Okay, so um, there's a woman named Judy Brown, and Judy Brown is uh, in the DoD world and in the mobile world. She, she runs a website called mLearnopedia. Um, she's very well recognized in the field. And she has three criteria for a mobile device. Um, it has to have a battery that lasts for uh, six to eight hours, or all day, as it were. Uh, it has, it's yours, it's your personal device, and it's instant on, okay? That's, that's the three, that's her three. My addition is that it has to fit in your pocket because it would always be with you. So I always ask the question, how many people here are going to dinner tonight, right? Okay, of you going to dinner, how many people have your mobile phone with you? How many people are gonna have your iPad with you? One. You know what, I used to actually be able to argue that point, but I actually have this small bag that I carry now, which people do refer to as a purse, so I can't really say, but it doesn't fit in my purse. <laughs> But that, that's kind of my, that's, that's my argument for it. And it's not always connected. You know, this phone is always connected. This is not. That's only with the Wi-Fi version. What is the overlap? Okay, so the first thing that I would do, again, is, is test your users, right? I mean, that's, I can't stress that enough because it's not, oh, I'm sorry, what is the design overlap between designing good learning and designing games? Okay, and what can we do? Um, first of all, test your users. You know, you want to make sure that um, your user base is willing to accept a game. Okay, because that's, I can't emphasize that enough. I mean, I, 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 there's a, a great thread about um, how games are not good for learning, which I don't agree with at all. In fact, the, the pieces that are, it was on a, a LinkedIn 
discussion group. And one person did point out that, one person agreed with it, and the rationale was, we implemented some gamification pieces in our learning, and the users hated it because the time to take the course extended to like 45 minutes from 15 when they could just go through with it. That's not a game problem, that's a user problem. She admitted, later in the thread, that they had never tested it. So the first and foremost thing to do is to say, look, okay, do you guys want a game? I mean, would you be willing to use that? Um, second to that, and, and I have to say that one of the things about games and learning that, that is a little bit challenging. Um, um, audience, and making sure that you're committed to your audience. <laughs> okay, that's point number Wait, two. Audience in the first place, where, where should I be looking? Point number three, um, one of the things that is difficult is that there aren't, in my mind, any real successful ways of tracking in-depth metrics of gameplay yet. Now, Aaron is, is working with Tin Can, and I think that there's a lot of possibility there. Um, I'm, I happen to work on another standard called CMI5, uh, which is a complement to Tin Can, um, and we're working on that very same problem. Um, and we're working at it, again, as I mentioned, from the simulation world, because in a flight simulator, I can track everything that a pilot does, and I've got a meaningful gauge against what the pilot was supposed to do. So the gameplay can be built in that same manner if you have a good data starting point. So understanding that and understanding how to track your metrics is also crucial. Um, in terms of design, aside from just talking to your users, you want to build a game design and a game that's meaningful to their situation. You know, and again, I don't want you to think that that means that you have to have a game that's on a screen. You know, I mean, the screens, again, are, are resources. So can you build a game that's outside of that? You know, I, I mentioned at the beginning card games. You know, we built uh, you know, these, these card games that are really simple for people that use no tech at all. And people love them because they're so simple. So don't make it complex. Talk to your users. And make sure that it's appropriate for uh, what, what the material is. Am I done now? Am I being kicked off? I think so. Okay. All right. Well, sorry. Thank you.